What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Self Helpless Podcast. I'm Delaney Fisher. And I'm Kelsey Cook. And today we have such an incredible guest, one of my favorite episodes by far, Sonia Renee Taylor. Sonia is an author, spoken word artist, social justice activist, and founder of the Body is Not an Apology movement. She is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love. She's also made appearances on networks like MTV, BET, Oxygen, CNN, NPR, HBO, all over the place. And she has delivered multiple TED Talks, including the Let's Replace Cancel Culture with Accountability Talk, which is why she is joining us today for the Helpster's Choice winning topic, Cancel Culture versus Accountability. Yeah, she Kelsey, is incredible. Yes, uh, Kelsey, do you have any announcements before we dig into this fantastic interview with Sonia? For sure. You guys know that uh, my tour, the Hustler Tour, is up and running. It's been so great. Um, my, my upcoming dates, I'm at the Skyline Comedy Club in Appleton, Wisconsin, this weekend, September 16th through the 18th, and then Moon Tower Comedy Festival in Austin, Texas, September 22nd through the 25th. Uh, Washington, D.C. Finally, we've got those dates. We've had to move them twice, and I'm so excited to be there. D.C. Comedy Loft, September 30th through October 2nd, and then uh, October 13th through the 16th at Punchline in San Francisco. So many more coming up. KelseyCook.com for your tickets. It's pretty much every weekend through the end of the year and into next year. So go see where I'm coming. Probably coming to a city near you. Go do it. Laugh your arse off, everybody. Go see (laughs) Kelsey live. Do it. Um, and you can head over to delaneyfisher.com for information about my business simplicity coaching program and for the aficionado podcast. At this point in time, we are currently at capacity in the program, but I do offer a comp, um, call once a week to somebody who is interested in learning more and just getting some information and guidance and feedback about their business. So that's all at my website. So let's dig into this discussion with Sonia Renee Taylor, and you're going to want to grab your notebooks because holy shit, there's a lot of good stuff in here. So much good stuff. Thank you so much for being here today. So Sonia, can you share what led you to the work that you do now? Um, sure. So, I mean, that's a, it's a big, that's a big question with a lot of pieces in it. <laughs> uh, um, you know, right now I would say that the primary work that I do is as an author and an activist advocating radical self-love as a framework for how we understand our relationships to our own beings, our own bodies, our own persons, and how we use it as a tool to, um, to transform systems and structures in society to create a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. Uh, So that's what I would say I would do. The journey that I took to doing that work has been, you know, 35,000 different trails. Um, But back in 2000 and, ooh, 2010, yeah. Yes. And I was like, Ooh, when did that happen? Time. Uh, <laughs> back in 2010, I had a conversation with a friend. Um, I was a performance poet, a slam poet. That was what I was doing for a living. I had a conversation with a friend um, about some sexual health choices uh, that she was making and concerned about. My friend had a disability, was afraid that she might have an unintended pregnancy. And um I also used to be a sexuality health educator, so I'm notorious for getting in your business about all your business. And <laughs> so and so I ended up asking her about her sexual health choices with this particular person she was afraid she might be pregnant by. And my friend, you know, shared a very honest response with me that she, you know, just basically didn't feel entitled to ask this person about uh, condoms because her disability made it difficult for her to be sexual already. And I said to her in the conversation, very unconsciously, I think, you know, I like, I frame it as it was through me, not of me. Um, I said, your body is not an apology. It's not something you offer to someone to say sorry for my disability. And, and when I said that, something got made. Something got made in me, something got made in her, and then something got made in the world. And I didn't know exactly what that would be at the time, but I was like, that was real poetic. Maybe that's a poem. And so I wrote a poem. And then that poem began shifting and and shifting the way that I was living in my own body, started 
actually getting in my business about the places where I wasn't aligned with this message of the body is not an apology. Um, and one of the ways was simply I had a little selfie in my phone that I really felt beautiful and fabulous in and was also hiding because I felt like I didn't have the right to feel beautiful and fabulous in it. Like uh, who, you know, this, this body, this black body, this fat body, this queer body didn't have the right to feel as beautiful as I felt. And so I hid the picture um, and I hid the picture for about five or six months. And then someone posted a photo of a plus size model on my Facebook page that inspired me to finally post my picture. I posted it. I asked other people to post pictures where they felt powerful in their bodies. 30 people tagged me in photos. Uh, and the next day I was like, maybe I'm just going to start a Facebook page where we have the opportunity to love and affirm ourselves. That'll be sweet. A good place for us to just be unapologetic. And since I have this poem, I'll just call the page. The body's not an apology. Uh, and so that was a decade ago. And now we're a, <laughs> a multi-international company and digital media company, a New York Times bestselling book, a workbook, uh, a totally transformed life and transformed lives using this framework of radical self-love. Oh my, I got chills when you told that story. <laughs> Just like that, that moment with your friend sparked everything. That is yeah. what a freaking moment. Holy it, shit. That is it was so a moment. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big moment. I also yeah. love Beautiful. using the word powerful um, because I think especially on social media, there's kind of this, um, this worry amongst people where you don't ever want to come off full of yourself. And I think women are hesitant to ever say like, I feel beautiful in Mm -hmm. this photo, that there's something about saying that you think you feel beautiful or sexy, that it can kind of be looked at as you're full of yourself. But there's something about the word powerful that is just like, I just love that so much yeah. I feel like it kind of banishes that fear of of appearing that way and yeah. again those are dumb things to worry about but I well think I mean real not thing. even so much that there's dumb things to worry about I think that for me I'm like I'm always interested in troubling or getting underneath what is the thing that's motivating that whatever that is and you know this idea of like the self-censoring we do because we don't want to feel full of ourselves we don't want to be seen as arrogant all of those things to me live inside of this realm where the the perception of that is about if I am fully in my power, whether that power emanates from me as beauty or that power emanates from me as sexiness or that power emanates from me as intelligence, however that power gets manifest, if I'm fully in it, then it must mean there's less for you. And that's the system of comparison that we're all invested in that keeps us playing inside of this game of hierarchy where if there is, if, if I am enough, you must be less. And that's the dynamic. That's the thinking that I'm interested in getting us to ship. Yeah. Oh, yes. Would you mind just sharing about what is the difference between cancel culture and accountability? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, first I just kind of want to name like, I stumbled into this conversation around cancel culture. All of a sudden, people (laughs) call me and ask me about cancel culture all the time. And I'm just like, how did I get here? (laughs) And I'm like, I think I had talked about it one day. And now all of a sudden, I'm like the resident expert. And I'm not, be clear. Um, But I do have a perspective about it. And I think that that perspective lives inside of this larger framework of radical self-love that is my work. Um, and, And the perspective that I have is that the, the problem is that we have a framework right now around um, a, one that all of the ways that we think about these issues are mired in binary thinking, right? They are all mired in it is this or it is that. Um, so it is either, and so inside of that, what ends up happening is someone makes a, a mistake or an egregious intentional harm. These all, you know, but the problem is we treat everything with a one size fits all kind of approach. And part of that is because we as a species, as a society, struggle with nuance. And the only understanding that we have currently about accountability comes inside of a punitive system, right? Like the only way societally that we talk about accountability is jail. It's prison, right? And so... Mm -hmm. If the only thing you understand of accountability is punishment, then that's the only way that we know how to be in relationship with one another. Whereas if we understand accountability as actually not an act of um, 
punishment. Because the reality is there are millions of people in jail who are like, I didn't do it. I'm not, I didn't do it. So they never took account. There was no accountability that happened inside of that dynamic. There was just the assessment that a harm was done and then a punishment rendered. That doesn't require accountability. Accountability demands relationship. And, mm-hmm. and accountability without relationship is just punishment because two people have to be involved in a thing. You have to say you harmed me and I have to take responsibility for it. I have to say, yes, I did. And then, and then, then from there, there can be a conversation about what does repair look like? What does restoration look like? What does restitution look like? But if I don't ever own that a thing happened, then accountability doesn't exist. And so cancel culture doesn't require accountability. Cancel culture is just punishment. And don't get me wrong. I think, you know, I think that there are places well, first of all, let me, I'm going to trouble the language of cancel culture because we use it a lot. It's become really popular. And I actually don't think that's what we're talking about. I think that cancel culture is a really sneaky term that has come into the popular consciousness so that, so that folks who have historically held power can name the thing that's happening to them as a bad thing. Right. (laughs) Mm Because when someone's demanding that you be responsible for harms that you have continuously caused, right, the collective, um, the collective demand for that to happen, we identify as a culture. And then we say, oh, well, what you're asking is for me to be canceled. Right. And and I think it's way more nuanced than that. I think what's being asked for is for the people who hold power and positionality and that power and positionality allows them to be incredibly harmful to not have access to being incredibly harmful, which includes power and positionality. If you have a platform and you use it to be really harmful, you probably shouldn't have that platform until you learn how to navigate your harm. <laughs> that is that yeah. is a different thing than just like, we're canceling everybody. And so I think that's one piece of that. But the other piece is that, that there is... Um, a moment now where we're being asked to sort of catch up to ourselves, where technology and access to everyone's opinions, to everyone's historical thoughts, to everyone's former behaviors and present behaviors exists, right? Which means, but also at the same time, there is a system of hyper-visibility. Everybody's scrutinized at a really high level. And we haven't evolved to the technology. We haven't evolved to the, oh, now all my old mistakes are on display and all your old mistakes are on display. What do we do about that? We haven't figured out where we are emotionally, intellectually, and how to handle that. So we're using an old system, the system of punishment and punitiveness to handle what is a new technological issue, I actually think, and a new um, ideological issue, an issue that says like the the historical places where people were allowed to cause harm because they had so much more power, because they had so much more resource, because they had so much more um, sway in the world, we're no, lo- we're no longer accepting that. All of these things are sort of converging at the same time. So in your, obviously, okay, me being a comedian, then I also do some stuff um, like beauty makeup wise. And I feel like the comedy world and also the online beauty world been so much cancellation of people in those groups uh in the last few years are there like specific times where you see an instance of that and you're like I feel like their apology was sincere and that they are being accountable for their behavior versus somebody who just like doesn't get it and then in your mind you're like yeah they are kind of forever somebody I will never be a fan of again I don't know if I follow anybody close enough to be, you know, like I don't have time to be following people's individual apologies. That's half the problem, right? So this is half right. the problem is that we're in everybody's business. And as a person who likes being in people's business, we also have to learn like <laughs> if accountability is relational, I don't have a relationship with everybody, right? And right. so if accountability is relational, I don't have a relationship with everybody. So I am not, I, not, I don't need to demand accountability from everybody. And I think that's one of the things also that technology, social media has created is this sense of faux relationship. So, 
you know, I saw you tweet something person I don't know, I don't engage with, I don't bother with, and now I must hold you to account. Who has time to be the world police like that, right? Like, that's a <laughs> lot. That's, I don't have time for that. Yeah. Um, you know, and so for me, I'm much more interested in saying, where is, where does this person's life intersect with mine such that it makes sense for me to demand accountability from them, right? Um, mm. And so there are definitely places where that exists, where it's like, oh, this thinking you have right now, I, I can trace that to a direct impact on me that I actually need to see mitigated. Then yeah. there are other people where, or it, am I better, am I better useful to take the energy it is to address this individual and actually address the systemic issue that's underneath it. Um, and so these are questions that I think we don't ask ourselves. I don't have, you know, I don't have any specific like, oh, this person was a really sincere apology. Here's what I do think. I think that, that if I caused harm, legitimate harm, and I'm sincere about wanting to not cause harm anymore, um, depending on what the level of that harm is, and particularly if we're talking about canceled, my hunch is usually those are not tiny infractions. They may be tiny infractions to the person, but obviously to the collective, they're not, which is why a whole bunch of people decided you could be canceled. Right. It, it might make sense to take a time out and go figure out what how you went off the path you meant to be on. Like, I think timeouts are great, and I think we should issue them you know, liberally in the world, the same way parents issue liberally timeouts to toddlers. Go yes. figure out your <laughs> shit, right? Like you got to go sit down and get them that thinking together. And so yeah. I actually am suspect of anybody who gets met with this sort of energy of cancellation. And it's like, I'm sorry. in two hours later. And it's like, I don't understand why I'm not allowed to just be doing the same things I was doing. I said, I was sorry. And I'm like, I don't think you've actually had a chance to process what happened to actually be in any kind of self-reflection or analysis in the last 30 minutes. So maybe right. no, you know? Right. Like yeah. it's a quick little bandaid. Yeah. Uh, I, and, uh, yeah. I heard you, I heard you talking to Amanda Seals about apology versus absolution. Can you mm -hmm. explain what those differences are and how sometimes apology is not really meant for the person. It's to make the other person. Oh, look better. Absolutely. And it's probably one of my most annoying things about this late, this way that we think about apology. Oftentimes what people want, right. And this is again, why I said it's important that you have to actually sit with yourself. You actually have to sit with yourself and say, what is my real motivation? What's my why in this moment? And Oftentimes, we're just so busy wanting to not be uncomfortable anymore. I'm in the hot seat and I want to get out of the hot seat and I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to get out of the hot seat. So automatically, from that lens, this whatever you're about to do isn't about the person or the harm. It's about you wanting to get out of your feelings. And I think that it's important for us to be able to sit and be like, oh, I'm making this about me. And the whole point was this wasn't about me. <laughs> this is about someone who got hurt. And so is the desire. And, you know, in this conversation with Amanda, I was talking about an incident that happened with a friend of mine, Dr. Yaba Blay, who, um, you know, who had someone, she had an influx of new white followers on her very black page where she posts very black culture, funny content. And um, this influx of new white followers, one of her new white followers uh, didn't like one of the videos she posted. And then commented that she didn't like the video that she posted and then reported the video and Yaba's page was taken down and the video was removed. And of course Yaba was enraged. Like you, so, <laughs> so you're just allowed to come here and not like something you don't even understand. And now I'm not even allowed to exist. That's, that's how white supremacy works. Right. And so this woman outs herself, right? Like Yaba's like, I don't know who did it, but and this woman outs herself. It was me. I'm sorry I was wrong. You know, and 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 Yaba's like, I'm not interested in hearing from you. I don't have anything to say to you. Like, whatever. Her Yaba's fans are like, lady, you should probably let it go. Um, like, let it go. The woman's like, no, I'm gonna then she proceeds to write. Um, because the way that she ended up to the page was from Glennon Doyle 
and um, Abby Wombat uh, in a, a v- collaborative event they all did together. So then she writes an email. She tags uh, Abby Wombat. She includes Glennon Doyle. She includes Tarana Burt. I mean, she's just like roping in people. Like, please forgive me, forgive me. And it became very clear that she. This wasn't actually about restoring a relationship with Yaba one because she never had one. This was about clearing her name in the widest sense that she could. This was, I need absolution, which is I need to be cleared of any sin. I need to be removed of any sin, any wrongdoing. I need to be made pure again in the eyes of the social media public. And I'm going to demand it. I'm going to demand it by demanding all of your attention on me until someone forgives me. That's not an apology. That's not accountability. It's not responsibility. It is merely about the protection of one's own ego under the guise of of accountability. And actual apologies are a desire to, to make right what you made wrong and sometimes also to understand that that isn't possible, that you cannot fix what you made wrong. You can't do anything. And that, you know, I learned in 12 Step. Some of the best amends you can ever make is to leave people the hell alone. The biggest gift that you can give to somebody is to, the biggest sorry you can ever say is, I will stay out of your life. And people need to understand that nuance. So when you find that it's about you and the thing you really want, that's probably absolution. That's not an actual apology. Well, and that's what your friend asked for. She said, I don't want to hear anymore from you. Like she even right. made it that clear no, me and yeah. this woman didn't respect her wishes or her boundaries and then continued to make it about yeah. her. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. So what is the happy medium with trying your best not to fuck up and perpetuate further harm and knowing you're going to fuck up? Like, how do you, how do you show up knowing you're going to mess up, but yeah. still do it? <laughs> So, I mean, I think that's step number one is knowing you're going to mess up, to own you're going to mess up. I know I'm going to mess up. And to hold when you mess up with not just your experience of it, but to really be present to the impact and to understand that people are not going to be nice to you about it because you messed up. In particular, you know, and I think we've got a name that a lot of the conversation, certainly cancel culture and calling out and all of these things happen over a multitude of issues, right? They certainly sort of saw a bit of a, like a pinnacle around sexual um, violence and sexual assault things. Um, But we are right now in a moment where a lot of it is around racial justice and those sorts of things. One of the things that I think is really important, I was thinking about this yesterday and I'll have a what's up y'all coming about it soon, is that there is a conversation that, like I've been uneasy lately about conversations with white people about cancel culture and color. And I'm like, something's, Hmm, something's off. What is it, Sonia? And I've been thinking about it. And I, I think I got to what it is for me yesterday. And I think that it is that what ends up happening is that there's a desire. Again, the desire isn't about like, I really want to transform whatever it is that is in me that is tied to a legacy of harm. Because that's the piece that I think people have to get is that folks aren't like, oh, you just made this one mistake and now I'm writing you off. People are like, I'm responding to your one mistake that is the same mistake that now I have had to respond to for the last 400 years, right? It's like, fine. If the first person steps on your foot, you're like, okay, no worries. Carry on. The second person steps on your foot, you're like, okay. By the time the third person steps on your foot, you're like, if y'all don't get off my dad, right? Like you're ready to, <laughs> that person is about to catch the wrath, right? right? And it's because the experience is repetitive, regardless of the individual. And I think that that's a thing that sometimes we forget inside of these dynamics is that people are tired of a repetitive experience. You just happen to be the person du jour rendering that experience. And so the, the, the work is, can I be in the discomfort of recognizing that I'm part of a pattern? This isn't even about me, the individual. This is me as a representative of a pattern of behavior over an extended period of time that a significant number of people are over. And so I need to be willing to be uncomfortable as this pattern gets revealed and 
if, as I do the work to interrupt my role in this pattern. That's my assignment. And that means that sometimes people are going to tell me that that pat, you know, that I'm a part of that pattern in ways that do not feel good. They're going to tell me that. And there'll be times when sometimes people tell me that I'm a part of it in ways and they're a little bit more gentle. And I should cherish that when that happens. But I should understand that it's actually not even about me. So what would it look like one for me not to be super personalized, uh, personalized about it? And, and that when it is about me such that it impacts me, right? Such that somebody's like, you know, I'm about to tell everybody to never come to your show again or whatever the case may be. Can you can we be present to how we got there, to the why of why that's happening? Because if we can get to the why of why that's happening, then we can settle our nervous system a bit such that we can actually respond from a rational place that wants us to actually change. And the issue with this conversation is it's like, I don't actually want to change. I just want to feel better. It's the absolution issue again, right? It's like, I don't actually want to be deeply transformed so that I'm no longer a part of a historical pattern that causes harm. I just want to be out of the hot seat today. And as long as that's the underlying energy behind the conversation of like cancel culture and calling out, then what actually that does is that just says, I'm okay if the pattern stays in place, just leave me alone. And the people who are experiencing the pattern are saying, no. And so until, until the folks who are part of the pattern are as committed to interrupting it as the people who are tired of being impacted are committed to interrupting it, then what we call cancel culture and call out is going to continue to happen. And so the balance that you're asking for is how do I on a daily basis live into interrupting the pattern of white supremacist delusion inside of myself? How do I interrupt the ways in which I've been indoctrinated into a system of anti-Blackness and anti-people of color and anti-queer people and like all of the ways in which we've been indoctrinated into believing that there are some bodies that are more valuable than other bodies? How do I interrupt that in myself on a daily basis such that, such that when I get called out, I actually am already on the journey? It don't sting as much if you're already doing the work. And if you're already doing the work, the world sees you. If you're already doing the work, the people in your life already know that. And so you actually, it's hard to cancel somebody you already legitimately know is making the effort. So that's mm -hmm. the thing I think is the middle point is, am I already doing the work to interrupt this pattern such that when I make a mistake, it is a reflection of the fact that, of course, I'm human and you already know I'm invested in you. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. That was... That was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Kelsey. Just, I like so I said, these are just my thoughts. I don't, you know, I'm, <laughs> so good. I'm like taking notes. And I hope you <laughs> when you were talking earlier about people who um, kind of make a quick apology, but then don't take that time out for themselves to actually show that they are processing it and doing the work on themselves. Sometimes I feel like we've seen um, in the media, somebody get canceled and go quiet. And then people look at that as like, oh, look at them just running from the problem and being a coward and not wanting to be a part of this. So like what, in your mind, what do you think is the difference between when you see that and knowing, okay, this is somebody who's taking the time to actually go work on themselves and somebody who's just like, I don't want to see this or hear this or feel bad about myself. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, again, if, if again, the basis of all accountability is relationship, then step one is, have I first been in relationship? Have I acknowledged the, the harm mm, that, yeah. that was named, right? Have right. I said, I want to hear, I hear you and I want to hear you. Can I be accountable to this? I would like to be accountable to this. Is there anything else that I need to take away with me while I go and sit? I need, I want to take time and I need to process this, but I want to make sure that I'm, that I am hearing what it is that I'm being asked to reflect on. Is there other things out there that I need to be reflective on? That's relationship. Yeah. If you do that first and then you go away, people understand why you go away. There's a context for why you went away. There was a yeah. space first for people to name the thing they needed to name. And then you also let them know what you were doing next. You gave them um, information about how you plan to follow up. All of that is relational. And yeah. that is the piece that's the difference. If you just like, I'm out, you know, people say right. something, I'm going to go think about what I did but you never told anybody, you never gave anybody a chance to reflect. That's not relational. That's I want out of the high seat. Yeah. 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 
So uh, I'm just curious in, in all the work that you've done, what are the things that you've noticed that really hold people back from actually listening to each other, understanding each other's perspective and moving forward? Why Mm. is it so divisive? So I think that we, I think there are a couple of things and inside of this work of radical self-love that I talk a lot about the fact that none of us are innately, we didn't come, we didn't arrive here like, I'm here to harm people. I'm a, just a little baby, but I'm about to ruin lives, right? Like that's not, <laughs> that's not, that's not how we show up, right? Um, all of the ways that we harm are learned behaviors. They are indoctrinations into systems and beliefs and ways of being that we have taken in um, and then given back out into the world. And so I think that part of the work is to be is that we don't we don't actually understand like actually this isn't anybody's I don't nobody arrived here to harm right and there but for the grace of God go I is probably one of my favorite biblical I don't even know it's not actually a biblical phrase I don't know I'm a heathen but what I do know (laughs) is that it resonates it resonates for me the remembrance that if I had been given a similar set of circumstances, beliefs, ideas, and you know, context, I would probably turn out very similar to whoever the person is that I'm mad at. That's the thing that I think is important to remember is that everybody has a story that made them. Everybody got made is the way that I talk about that. You got made, I got made. And can we hold that? Can we actually hold that? The other piece is, can I hold the complexity that there are things that cannot be fixed or certainly cannot be fixed in the immediate. That there are times when, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, I have a lot of friends who work in transformative justice spaces and it's about figuring out how we mend harm. Um, And there are things that cannot be fixed in the ways that we understand fixing, but that's also because we have such a limited version of, You know, what does it mean to fix a thing? It means that nobody's mad at you anymore, right? It means that everybody's back together. And those are not real life paradigms. Those are not the truth of human nature and the complexity of human emotion. And so what does it mean to be like, I came as far as I can come. I've done the best that I can. And that may never be good enough. And can I hold that that person has the right to feel like it's never good enough? Because part of what happens is I'm mad at you because you have because you didn't forgive me. <laughs> well, if you not harm me, we would never be in this place to begin with, right? And so right. this is yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. that creates it this repetitive going, going. cycle, yeah. right? Where right. is it? Where if everybody can get to a place, and it's not even everybody, if you, because that's part of the problem is we're so busy waiting for the other person to do a thing the other person to become a thing, the other person to show up a way. If I can say, I've given all that I can, I've given the best that I can, I'm willing to keep showing up as best as possible to this conversation. And it will always be imperfect. And I may never be forgiven. This person may never forgive me. And they have that right. They are not bad or wrong because they decided to never forgive me. They have that right. And if that person can say, I've, you know, I've been in this process as much as I can, And I'm not going to ever forgive them. And that doesn't mean they didn't try. I just know that I'm not. Okay. Can we be in the tension that lives in that place? Right? There's no resolution there. It's like hearing a discordant note and you're waiting for the note to resolve. And then you're like, "Eh, play the note. (laughs) Play the next note. And nobody (laughs) plays the next note. And you're like, ah. But we have got to learn how to be in that, how to sit in that discomfort. And I think if we can sit in that discomfort, we will find that time, that our own healing softens those places that feel so hard and discordant. Um, But we have to stop waiting for everything to be tied. We've watched too many movies that tie everything in a neat, tiny bow. And we think that that's what life is. And it's not. And can we be in the discomfort of that with with ourselves and with one another? Yes. And I feel like, and I'm talking about myself too. It's like, we have a hard time admitting when we were wrong and that, that we messed up. And so where do you think that comes from? Why can't we all just say, look, it's okay to be wrong. It's what we do going forward. Why are we all so freaked out and scared admitting that? Because we've turned being wrong into being bad people. 
right? If I, if I messed up, I'm a bad person. And if I'm a bad person, then that means I won't belong. And the human desire is to belong. Human desire is connection. And if you feel, I mean, so some of this is just evolutionary, right? If you were, if you messed up in the clan and they kicked you out, that was a bear. You were a bear's dinner. That was a rat for you, right? <laughs> like it was a mortal, it was a mortal mistake. And so there is still a, an evolutionary fear in us, in us of being excluded and the danger that exclusion happens. But there's also an emotional fear in exclusion and the aloneness and isolation that experiences in that. And so if we have made I make mistakes means I'm a bad person, then the only way to rectify that is to either is to never make mistakes, which we know is not possible, or to deny that you ever make mistakes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those are the yeah. only two options, right? Those are the choices we're left with. And so what ends up happening is we will we become unwilling to look at the places where we're wrong because we believe that the stakes are so high. Absolution, you know, exclusion. And what I think the the work is, is to recognize that my mistakes don't make me a bad person. They make me a human, right? Can I invite in my own humanity? Because the more, this is radical self-love work, the more I invite in my own humanity, the greater my capacity to hold the humanity of others. When we are super exclusionary, super banishing, super mean at the first infraction to other people, it's usually just a reflection of how we are in relationship with ourselves. And so if I can change the nature of that relationship with myself, if I can not exclude myself, not abandon myself, not not belong to my own self, then it becomes so much easier to hold all of the complexities of other beings. It also feels like that struggle to uh, forgive yourself and not fall into the narrative of, oh, if I make a mistake that I'm a bad person, I feel like that is getting harder and harder, unfortunately, as the stakes get higher and higher with cancel culture. Because it's like, that does feel like death for certain people. If their career is done, it's like, oh my God, this thing I've worked for for years and now it's like, I can't leave the house or whatever. It's just is so hard, I think, for that narrative, which is the right one. Like you said, that we need to be able to feel like if we make a mistake that we can apologize right. and know that we're not necessarily bad people, but it, it's really hard. It's, it's <laughs> I think it's society hard. right now. I definitely think yeah. it's hard. I think though that I also think that there's an opportunity for us to really get present to like, what does cancel culture really mean? Right? Yeah. Like the truth of the matter is short of, again, inside of a system where basically we just mean prison, right? We mean, if you did something that was prison worthy, then right. maybe you got sent to jail, right? Like that's the biggest cancellation that we actually have right now, right? Right. Every other thing, I have actually not seen anybody who wasn't on their way to jail, <laughs> right? But who got canceled for something, not actually be able to come back from that. It's actually not true. And this is the thing I think we're missing about life. It's not even about cancel culture. Seasons end, calamity happens. Stuff goes drastically off the rail. And then you rebuild. And that is life. That's life, whether or not this institution or this instance of cancel culture that we are talking about right now existed or not. Things will dramatically go left that you are not anticipating (laughs) in your life. And you will have to figure out how you shift, how you change, and what becomes next. That is actually, the thing is that what's happening inside of cancel culture is that people are stepping into that more quickly than they would if just the energies of life kept moving. We're yeah. kind of booby trapping the field for great awakenings. <laughs> That's really what I call it. It's a great yeah. awakening. And you know, you just stepped in a great awakening. What you gonna do with it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So from listening to you talk about this, I'm thinking like cancel culture doesn't actually exist. It's collective accountability, right? That's kind of my, I don't think cancel culture is a real thing. I think, yeah, I think that it is a term that we've created to figure out how to make a thing that doesn't feel good also sound like a bad thing. <laughs> and I don't, right, yeah. and I don't actually think it's a bad thing. You know, I, right. I, I was talking yesterday, last year, I had what I called a great awakening. Things went real left, 
real fast. <laughs> and it didn't have anything to do with like anybody from the external world canceling me. But life was like, hey, we're about to hand you your ass. Boom, boom, boom. And it was terrifying and it was horrifying. And it felt like the worst thing in my entire world. And it wasn't. It was a gift. It was a painful, really like, you know, barbed wire wrapped present, (laughs) but the inside was stunning and it was a great awakening. It was an interruption of patterns of my life that had caused me harm and caused other people harm that I'm happy to be rid of today. And, you know, I could run around and be like, ah, Great awakening culture is ruining my life, right? (laughs) I could see it as this horrible thing. I could, right? Or I could see it as the opportunity that the universe has given me to interrupt some things that were going to come and get me anyway. And that's Mm -hmm. what I actually understand inside of what we're calling cancer culture is. You were doing some things that you needed to stop doing regardless. And unfortunately, you had to get smacked extra hard to stop. What you going to do now? What are you going to do with this opportunity? Holy Man, thank shit. you so that much. Was, I could talk to you for 15 hours straight. <laughs> Sonia, that was awesome. Where can people find you, your book, everything, all the, all the stuff? Yeah, so um, definitely get the book, The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love. Get the workbook, uh, Your Body is Not an Apology workbook. They go together like a sandwich. Um, and you can buy those any place books are sold. I prefer you go to an independent woman-owned, person-of-color-owned bookstore. That's the best place to get them. But you can also get them on my website. It's on your Renee Taylor.com. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, although that's not the place where I kick it really. Right now, I'm mostly kicking it on Patreon. Um, and all of those things are Sonia Renee Taylor. Uh, and you can learn more about the work of The Body is Not an Apology at thebodyisnotanapology.com across all platforms. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking your time today and educating us and our community. Thanks for inviting me. I deeply appreciate it. (laughs) What a conversation. (laughs) I'm going to have to listen to this one so many times. She had so many quotables in this episode. I know. I know. I was just like t-shirt, (laughs) t-shirt, like bumper stick. I mean, it was so many good things. Um, We have an iTunes review of the episode. This is from ABCNIC. It says, a breath of fresh air. I love this podcast. I like self-help. I like to laugh. This is great. Keep it up. Thanks. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time uh, to to leave us a review. And I know we're a broken record around here, but we just love if you can take a second to leave us an iTunes review and a five-star rating. It keeps us on the chart. So thank you guys sincerely when you do that. And then we get to read it on the show. Any hot segments, shitty segments, what do you got? Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, I have my cast off now, but I, um, I chipped the tip of one of the bones in my wrist off while playing volleyball a couple oh, weeks ago. God, it sounds so painful. It, it was, sounds so painful. It was horrific. It, I, oh, oh, God. I really, I've gotten pretty lucky that in all my years of playing sports, I have not had a major injury or a broken bone. Um, and, uh, you know, getting older, I guess. I'm not sure. But I, um, I play in a four-on-four four out, outdoors grass league. And, you know, some of these dudes hit the ball so fucking hard And I got teeny tiny little wrists and I went to dig a ball and it just knocked my wrist a direction. It shouldn't have gone. And I heard a a loud crack. Oh, and you know, you've played sports your whole life. Sometimes like you'll hear a crack and it's a knuckle pop or something like that. Or your tendon tearing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or your bone shipping all the (laughs) ice. That was my, that's the crack I remember. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. Really? (laughs) The Achilles. Yeah, oh, but shit. I've never heard a bone crack. I wonder how different that would be. Let me tell you, it's uh, pretty fucking chilling. Like, it's a sound you never want to hear. Oh. Because it's loud, and it, you f- I felt it immediately. Um, but I have, I have a, a high pain tolerance for whatever reason, and so it hurt really bad, but then I kept playing. I played for, like, another two points because I just thought, like, maybe I just popped a knuckle weird or something. Um, and then like when the ball was hitting my arm, it was just shooting pain. So I stepped off the court 
and I tried bending my wrist backward. And then I, that's when I burst into tears. Cause I just was like, Oh my God, this is like, something's wrong. And so, um, I went to, um, the ER and got some x-rays done and yeah, I, I, I chipped the tip of a bone off and that's just wild to me that you can apparently do that from a volleyball Ooh. being hit that hard. But, um, I was in a soft cast the last two weeks. Um, I'm out of it now. I have most of the mobility back in my wrist, but God, I tell you, it was the shit I was having to do when you only have one hand is so bizarre. Like I couldn't just open a can of cat food. I'd have to put the can of cat food on the ground and then push down on my foot or push my foot down on top of it and then use the other hand to rip it up. Like weird. If there was a camera in here, people would be like, what is going on in this apartment? But, um, oh yeah. And then they did, they just said that my body will absorb the bone like an X-Men. Or what? Something. Very bizarre. It'll absorb the bone. Like it's just, it'll just kind of like dissolve into itself and don't worry about it. Don't have to take it out. Don't have nope. to. It doesn't come back to the bigger bone. It just no. It's just gone. It just I I suck oh. it up. I don't know. It's like the my big fat Greek wedding with the fucking twin in her neck. <laughs> uh, yeah. That? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it so, in her neck? I don't know. Some kind of, the the fetuses that absorb the other one. You get what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That sounds very okay. painful. Hey, I'm okay. Yeah. Um, How are yeah. you? Well, I am currently, this is the first episode we're recording from my new home, right? I don't yes. think I've, we've done that yet. So Cam and I are moved in. We are slowly but surely getting our shit together. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm just like in a blank room and no, that's not just being my minimalist self. That's just because yeah. we're still getting our shit together. Although not going to be much else in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it is. Oh my God. I can't tell you how nice it's been to have space for the the things that like we enjoy doing or we want and having an office. Whole, oh my God. I just feel like having an office for my, my client calls and to record the podcast, being able to shut the door. You can't hear Maverick barking. That's been a game changer. Maverick has yeah. a yard. Um, which has been so nice. We're living in a neighborhood that we've loved for a really long time and just, yeah, just more space for things. And um, it's so funny because I don't, I never thought I was somebody who like would enjoy decorating a a place or any of that stuff. I always just felt like, ah, that's just not me. I just don't really give a shit. And I just kind of, you know, I used what I had for so long. It's interesting to actually be in a space where I, and really enjoying like putting things together and decorating and making our home look cute. And I'm like, Oh, I guess I did care about this. It just wasn't the priority at that time. Or I just, because I was living in such small spaces for so yeah. long, it just didn't feel, it felt overwhelming. So it's yeah. interesting to think like, Oh, I kind of wrote myself off as like not that type of person. And I've yeah. been really enjoying like making it cozy. Yeah. And stuff. So it's well, been fun. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I can't wait to show you. Have you over yeah. for dinner? Dinner. Would love that. <laughs> I would love that. Um, all right, you guys. Um, remember to head to KelseyCook.com and get those tour dates. Uh, hopefully see you guys in Appleton this weekend. And um, yeah, Delaney, anything else? DelaneyFisher.com for business coaching information and Efficionado podcast. And there's some other free stuff on my website that you might find helpful for your business. Awesome. All right, you guys, we love you and we will see you next week. Bye. Love you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. 